the bridges, the embankments, and cuts. They blasted and dug with their sweat and their guts. They never drank water but whiskey by pints. And their shanty towns rang with their songs and their fights. Navigator, navigator, rise up and be strong. The morning is here and there's work to be done. Take your tick and your shovel. And them old dynamite. We're to shift a few tons of this earthly delight. Yes, to shift a few tons of this earthly delight. Hey folks, sorry about Wednesday. Uh, I was not in a place where I could get very good Wi-Fi, so it wasn't have been feasible to stream. But I definitely, even if I can't do two streams a week, I want to at least do the book club every week. The vibe stream, maybe not every week. Uh, like, I don't know about next week. I do want to do more with Chris, though. Uh, I want to do... The one I... The last week's with Chris, I thought, was really fun. And I honestly prefer that to just, like, trying to read the comments. Because, honestly, they're hard to follow. And not a lot of them are great. I got to tell you guys. A lot of bad comments. A lot of, so it's hard to parse the good ones from the bad ones. Much funner to do it with Chris. So uh, I'm going to try to make that, like, maybe every other week. Because I don't want him to feel like he has to do it every week. But... Anyway, one thing I want to do every week is do the damn book club. So let's just start off very quickly uh, with chapter two of Reconstruction by Eric Foner. So one thing that um, Foner really lays out when he's breaking down the social order that is emerging and the social conflicts that are emerging in these in the southern states specifically is among the different populations who are ready to accept union uh, victory and accept uh, federal authority being reimposed there is a consistent um, pattern whereby any group will sell out, basically, the, the, uh, the interests of any other group that they do not feel that they are part of. So, like, the white Southern Unionists, for the most part, are perfectly happy to say, the Union won, slavery is abolished, but that their rights need to be, in some sense, uh, uh, over held over the rights of the freeds of the of the newly freed slaves but it's important to note this was not simply uh, a mechanism of racial discrimination by itself uh Foner points out that the uh relatively prosperous free colored population as it was known then of new orleans was also perfectly willing to sell out the interests of uh, of former slaves in exchange for being sort of uh, affirmed at the top of a social hierarchy. Uh, and it is important to remember, and something that I think gets lost in a lot of the um, the ta the uh, way that we frame civil rights, and the way that we frame um, like the virtue of citizenship is one of the things that's that like uh, does make, uh, like the a, a black American population seem to stand in for sort of like the virtuous, the most virtuous of us, as in the people in the United States who have benefited the least at the expense of others. A lot of that boils down to the fact that they didn't have anybody to sell out. There was nobody that they could have tried to negotiate against and sacrifice their interests in favor of. Because they were at the bottom of the fucking totem pole. Now, what that means, though, is that as a result, the black experience of America is one that has with it, like, an actual, uh, a, a enduring solidarity that transcends class. That there is something like a black destiny or, or black rights that need to be considered by people, even if they might not, you know, even if you're doing better than, that, uh, than other members of that group, uh, economically, there's still a um, an obligation there, which is one of the big reasons that, you know, black uh, people 
when they do vote, vote overwhelmingly Democratic, regardless of what their uh, economic um, position is. But it's not because people are better. It's not even that the culture they create is more virtuous. It's because there is nowhere else to go. And one of the reasons I think that America is such a monstrous country in its history and, and why it has become the country that has sort of remade the world in its image is because, thanks to proscri the existence of proscribed classes like blacks and uh, land that could be endlessly expropriated from Native Americans, meant that social solidarity was essentially never never needed to be, was never forced into being through conflict. Because it could always, social conflict by those, among those who are part of the polis, could always be offloaded somewhere else, onto somebody else. First, racial minorities in the United States itself, and then later, foreigners elsewhere. And now we're in a situation where uh, the, the frontier is closed, the myth is over, as Greg Grandin has pointed out, and we don't know how to be social. We do not know how to uh, accept the idea that there is fucking obligation to other people that transcends our individual interests. Because American history has essentially been able to avoid dealing with that question at every point by sacrificing the interests of somebody else somewhere else or someone who looks some different way. And that can't happen anymore. And now we don't know what to do. And we're having a gigantic... Uh, nationwide nervous breakdown out of that. Now, the reason that I think looking at Reconstruction and looking at a different Reconstruction that might have happened given the actual materials that were in play is that if because is that by accepting and, and teasing out the notion of a uh, of an alternative of a country that does come to terms with obligations and social solidarity and what it means to be, you know, uh, a citizen beyond just personal autonomy at all costs, uh, that we had the, we could have done it. Because to say otherwise is just to say that essentially is to take the, 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 the pessimistic, like the doom approach that, well, we were tainted because we had this land and because we had these racial categories, we were doomed from the beginning. Well, if that's the case, then why do anything? Why care about politics? Why focus on any of this stuff unless it's honestly a way for people who are relatively comfortable to uh, accept that, to, to stop feeling guilty about it, to say essentially, you know what? I wish we were in a country where, where that had some sort of social obligatory structures, and I wish... That, that there was humanity to our interactions and that wasn't just cold-blooded uh, calculation. But that darn racism, those darn... That's, what are we going to do? Oh, well. What are you going to do about it? I, I, I guess I, I can feel a little bad that I ended up at the top of this uh, situation, but there's nothing I can do about it. So uh, I can blame racists in the past and racists in the present none of whom are me. And that really does let us all off the hook. I mean, all kinds, any kind of black pill you want to take, any kind of doom-based politics you want to take, whether it's, whether it's a, a progressive one that emphasizes America's racism or a super racist one that says that because we have a, a, a multicultural society, we can't have anything good. That's all just a way to avoid the obligations of being a human a human and the obligations we have to each other that transcend any of these fucking uh, political arguments or our narrow understanding of fucking history, which is never a real conception. It is always a story we tell ourselves. We can always tell ourselves any story. There's no answer here. There is no true thing that we can drill out of our past. We can notice patterns and recognize patterns and try to recognize patterns when they emerge around us. But there is no facts. There is no fundamental thing that we can take from these. There are only stories we can tell ourselves. And I am trying to tell a story that leaves the aperture of possibility open. 
for ev for for change because to do otherwise is to is to abnegate your is to abdicate your responsibility as a human so in this chapter Foner also talks about the reconstruction governments of the war years because reconstruction is thought to have begun in 1865 but the Union held huge chunks of Southern territory through military occupation starting in 1862 and then expanding over the course of the war. So uh, there were essentially like reconstructed governments already being built before the war ended. And he goes through them. They were in Tennessee, uh, Maryland, Kentucky, and Louisiana. Those are the ones he focuses on. Um, and... What happened in most of these was a miniature version of what the Civil War was in general, which was an overthrow of a, a quasi-aristocratic, quasi-feudal planter elite by smallholders and, and, uh, and the emergent urban merchant class. The bourgeois revolution, the, the continuation and the fulfillment of the bourgeois revolution that began with the American Revolution, but which was essentially uh, arrested by the creation of the constitutional order. And what's interesting is, is when you look at the record of uh, Andrew Johnson as a military appointed governor of Tennessee during the war, he looked like a progressive. He looked like a man who had been uh, fundamentally altered by the experience of the war, who, who was in, noted for his stern hand to rebels, to his, uh, his vehement prosecution of, of traitors, and eventually to his sort of open-handed treatment of former slaves. Uh, but what's really important to note, though, is what was propelling this from Johnson was the resentment of slave owners felt by a guy who, at the end of the day, was a quasi-illiterate tailor and who had never been accepted and never could be accepted by the, 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 the best parts of, of Tennessee society and had with him sort of a Nixonian grudge. And that's what powered his politics. That's what made him a unionist during the war. That's what powered him towards uh, suppressive, uh, the suppression of uh, the pro-secession faction in Tennessee. But then, once he becomes president, and his and uh, his resentment goes from uh, a planter elite that is now dethroned to the new ruling class of Washington D.C., i.e., radical Republicans, that resentment goes. Uh, that powers him, and now powers him in a different direction, towards uh, reathroning all of the people he used to hate, in his mind for the good of the poor whites, but in reality for the reinscribement of all of the most reactionary, quasi-feudal elements of antebellum society. And the other thing uh, that. I think really needs to be emphasized in this second chapter is a theme that's going to be important to focus on as you go through the whole of Reconstruction, which is a, a push and pull between the necessities of prosecuting the war, which meant confiscation of property, which meant abrogation of all the liberal values that uh, that the the Whig the Whig model that uh, governed the Union side governing uh, ruling class held and those very uh, ideological precepts and with them the, the desire especially powerfully felt by Lincoln to keep the border uh, conf uh, the border slave states on the Union side uh, I honestly think that that focus of Lincoln's is probably his biggest blind spot over the course of the war it's understandable because obviously you don't want the border states to secede but once you get to the middle of the war, once you get to the, like, the point where military occupation of these places is already established, where like Tennessee is under military occupation, Maryland, Delaware are under military occupation, hell, Louisiana is mostly under military occupation, they don't really get a say anymore. You don't really have to kiss their asses so much, Abe. But Lincoln was operating from the same deliberative uh ideology, the same liberal orthodoxy that dominated the Republican Party. And that liberal orthodoxy is an, uh, 
this is a thing that Richard White talks about much more explicitly in The Republic for Which It Stands, uh, that liberal orthodoxy is one of the big hindrances to the war, uh, to the recognition of the actual implications of the war, which is that if we are overthrowing this uh, social order, then certain things are going to have to happen to carry that out. One, slavery is going to have to be abolished, but also the power of the slave owners and their ability to exercise power is going to also have to be abolished. But to do that would require a reordering of the state's relationship to citizenry that was anathema to uh, the um, center of gravity of opinion uh, in the Republican Party. And, of course, the, the financial and merchant interests that funded the Republican Party. And the thing that needs to be pointed out is that there were two things pushing against that liberal orthodoxy. One was just the exigencies of the war itself. Like uh, Benjamin Butler and Sherman and these guys who did radical stuff like c c confiscating slaves as contraband and then giving them land as, as uh, Sherman did when he was marching through the Carolinas. That they were not done ideologically, they were done out of necessity. I need, I need bodies. I need people to, uh, to build, dig ditches and, and build fortifications. Why not use these people who literally are begging me to take them in? Uh, and, or, or Sherman. I have these people. I don't have any means to feed or take care of them. Give them some land and let them farm themselves. And then I can focus on winning the war. So that's part of it. But the other thing, the other most crucial pressure that pushed... Uh, the war effort and, and reconstruction policy passed where uh, the average Republican office holder was comfortable with were the slaves themselves. It was a, it was a pressure from below that generated uh, the real productive tension with the governing ideology of uh, the North and between the governing ideology worth of the North and the project of winning the war and why the war is being fought. Okay, so let's go now to chapter three, which is where Foner breaks down the different ways that um, uh, the ex-slave population assert their um, their rights their, and their independence from uh, the, the slave economy and the slave society that was uh, generated by it. And Foner points out very astutely, and something that I think gets overlooked a lot, is that we talk about Reconstruction and the end of slavery as a challenge to getting, and as a challenge of getting the whites of the South and the North, for that matter, to be comfortable accepting black people as equal citizens. But there was a flip side to that, which is getting former slaves to accede to being part of a white ruled um, political order. How the hell do you go from being the property of people, the people who prescribed through your skin color, a, 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 a non-human, basically, status, uh, and then living amongst them as equals? or even putative equals of any kind, like just as contract freedom, which is what, as someone who could, ex how could you even imagine that you could exercise contract freedom with these people? And it really does suggest that, you know, the, the uh, that with all of Druthers being uh, had, that what would have been the preferable thing, at least for the former slaves, would have been Black self determination, you know. I mean, I uh, the the kind of stuff that the uh, Communist Party uh, pushed for in the nineteen thirties, uh, self determination for the black belt, uh, like not just land but political autonomy within the land that they would have had, 
And that's actually something that there's a book, Fire on the Mountain, that somebody recommended to me in this chat, and I read it. It's, it's pretty interesting. It's an alternative history, which I love, book where um, John Brown's raid is successful, and it sparks a rolling slave rebellion that over the course of years leads to a general um, a generalized rebellion against slavery throughout the South and the establishment of like a free black republic in the American South, which becomes socialist, which links up with uh, European socialist currents to the point where eventually by the mid 20th century, the United States itself has had a socialist revolution and is now allied with this former part of itself. But the problem with that dream is that it was this black self-determination was essentially impossible to enforce wherever it came into conflict with the white prerogative of power simply because there was no uh there was no mechanism for it the same way that the that the native americans were essentially unable to uh effectively combat the uh, westward expansion of the united states former slaves were in a similar uh a situation where because of the fact that they had been literally deprived of everything but their lives for their entire uh, existences upon freedom the the they did not have access to the capital or the organizational forms or the that could have effectively anyway uh, made an assertion of autonomy against white society they had to collaborate they were cursed to have to collaborate uh, with with whites in order to gain any kind of uh, self-determination, but not by themselves. And uh, what Foner points out here is that in places where the white prerogative existed, like labor, like this, the uh, like labor conditions and and the conditions by which labor is sold, and also the disposition of land, there was very little that uh, former slaves could do to assert their autonomy. Places that they could, though, were uh, in domesticity and, uh, and religious practice. Uh, and in, with domesticity, you see uh, a wholesale retraction out of the labor force of, uh, of former slave of black women uh, who were going to work at home, like was the ideal among white uh, families. So women were not supposed to work outside the home, ideally. There, there was a domestic sphere. And, uh, and part of black self-determination in, in, as, as slavery ended was withdrawing women and children from the workforce and into a domestic uh, situation. Um, And, of course, that wasn't able to be universalized, and, and in many cases it was resisted by local white authorities, but it was a, a assertion of, of autonomy. Uh, there is an interesting quote, though, I wanted to read from the, this chapter, uh, where Foner's talking about this assertion of, uh, of autonomy. And he says, Family itself, rather than a white owner or overseer, now decided where and when black women and children would work. And... I think that's an interesting sentence because it points to the way that that invisible hand of the market that of course is not invisible and is it's is actually you know the the uh the concerted rule of of, of capitalists does its most effective superstructural work at mystifying coercive relationships because the family was not going to be able to decide if women and children worked. Women and children might have to work if they need the money. If they need the money, they might have to have someone go out and work in the field or work domestically. They don't have that. They, they, they will, if they want to stay fed, have to accede to that. But they will not be forced to. They will not be directly uh, told to by a white owner or overseer. It will be just the market. 
It will be the fact that they don't have enough money. And so that becomes, it's felt as a voluntary relationship, but in reality, it is as coercive as the slave relationship. But because it is felt as autonomy, it is, it is de-alienated in that respect. And that's one of the things that has powered capitalism to the heights that it has, is that it can generate a lot of social misery that is impossible to place the source of by people who experience it. Now, when it comes to labor, the assertion of black autonomy boiled down to a demand for land ownership, which is obvious when you think about it. That was the sine qua non of freedom for all Americans going back to the revolutionary ethos. Like the yeoman, the yeoman smallholder was the ideal citizen, someone who did not owe their labor to another and could sustain themselves on their own land. And it was very, it's kind of amazing when you see the uh, sort of bafflement and, and, and outrage by a lot of even Northerners at the temerity of the slaves to insist upon uh, ownership of land uh, when that was the fundamental uh, expression of American liberty. The 1860 Republican platform uh, was, um, was advertised with the slogan, Vote Yourself a Farm, which culminated in the passage of the Homestead Act. But of course, many balked at the idea of giving, just giving the land, which of course, super absurd because the idea that this has not been worked for, the idea that this was a handout is monstrous because these are literally people whose labor had created the wealth in the first place. If they were owed anything, it was the land itself. Uh, but even more absurdly is a lot of Northerners insisted that there was no authority to take the land, that that the limited prerogative of the federal government did not extend to the to abrogating land from people. But there's another quote from this chapter, um, where a former slave, while talking to a Union officer, who is uh, not being enthusiastic about the idea of taking uh, land because it's against it goes beyond his authority, says. If you had the right to take master's slaves, you had the right to take master's land too, which is obviously the case. Because until the Civil War, slaves were property. The distinction between slaves and land, from a legal point of view, you might argue moral, but again, if morality was in, entered into this, then that, equi that equation would never have existed, was arbitrary. And that really is the entire uh, role. That's the goal. That's the, um, that is the reason that we have things like the Constitution and the reason that we have our political institutions is to draw arbitrary lines of power which protect private prerogatives and protect the existing power structures and resource distributions that we have and then call that natural. And I think, but I think it's very point, uh, important to point out the slave, the case for redistributing land to former slaves was legally, as I've said, and morally unassailable. You can't argue against it. It's on its face true, and it didn't matter because the only thing that yields power, the only thing that makes power yield is power. And there was not sufficient organized power to assert uh, uh, black rights to land beyond what in limited areas they were given almost as experiments uh, or as ad hoc measures of war. But one of the big uh, things that created conflict between the, um, the new regime, the new uh, reconstruction regimes and the ex-slaves is that ex-slaves wanted to pursue a, a subsistence agricultural living. They wanted to grow food for their families and maybe grow enough cash crops for a little bit of folding money, 
What they did not want to do was spend 12 hours a day in the field to grow cotton because they knew through experience that that money would not go to them, which of course was true. And you actually saw uh, a parade of northern do-gooders who went to the south to buy up plantations as experiments and have ex-slaves grow cotton again experimentally and then sell it as a, as a way to raise their standard of living with the expectation at all points that the lion's share of the profit would go to the person who had uh, who had who had uh, assumed the risk of buying the distressed plantation property and not you know the people who actually had worked the land their entire lives and who by any measure should have profited from all of it and so the 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 prerogative the 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 uh, the free slave desire for a subsistence livelihood was in direct conflict with the drive toward capital accumulation, which had defined the plantation agriculture before the war and was going to reassert itself after the war. Uh, and then just to end up, uh, the other thing that Fauna talks about is the emergence of... Uh, a political organization and expression on the par part of uh, the the black population in general, and then later the former slave population uh, as the as Reconstruction begins. Uh, in the immediate aftermath of the war, the leadership of um, uh, the black population that asserted itself in what was what in for the most part came down to self-organized political conventions that met, voted on resolutions, demands for land, demands for rights and treatment, and then essentially set them as, sent those uh, resolutions as entreaties to Washington. But they had no actual legal sanction. It, but what they were were uh, the first attempts to organize and create uh, a civic culture that could then interact with the... Uh, the governing culture over time. And at the, at the and the immediate aftermath of the war, the vast majority of the people who showed up to those conventions and spoke and wrote the resolutions were, uh, were free blacks from before the war uh, and ministers, uh, many of uh, the teachers uh, and veterans, essentially those members of the black community who had had some extended interaction with white institutions at some level, which gave them uh, the uh, the toolkit basically to go to a convention and and you know organize it and and interact with the the government and such. Now, as time went on, that changed though, as Reconstruction deepened and as uh, former slaves in the upcountry and in the deep plantation regions, as they came to self-organize, uh, those conventions that convened further off from the time of the end of the war became more and more dominated by actual former plantation slaves who were learning essentially the ropes of uh, civic engagement as, as they in, emerged from a condition of servitude. And uh, just to la wrap up uh, on the third chapter, uh, Fauner talks about the endemic and horrifying nature of violence carried out by uh, whites against former slaves all throughout the South. Thousands and thousands of murders, assaults. Uh, at this point, not really the lynchings that we think of, like the ritualized community lynchings, but more essentially guerrilla attacks, like attacking people in their homes or on the road. Um, and what that shows more than anything was that for Reconstruction to have any success, and I think, and this was something that was, it dawned on uh, Northern readership pretty early on, uh, there would have to be a significantly punitive uh, approach to dealing with former slave owners. Uh, there would have to be a continuation of violence. Uh, and that reality was the one thing that Lyndon Johnson, or Lyndon Johnson, uh, Andrew Johnson could not countenance. And the real disaster, more than anything, of presidential reconstruction, which happened uh, after the Lincoln assassination and before the radicals reasserted control of the process, 
uh, was that he wanted to allow the former slave owners essentially to get off scot-free. And what they were going to do with that freedom uh, is pretty clear, which was intimidate the former slaves into a condition of, of essentially de facto slavery through horrifying uh, application of violence. And this, honestly, for me, is the thing that makes me most most believe that a second Lincoln term, a Reconstruction uh, under Lincoln instead of Johnson, would have been fundamentally different and would have changed the trajectory. I don't know how much, but somewhere from where we ended up, because I just simply do not believe that Lincoln, having fought the war the way he had, and uh, would have allowed or would have been um, comfortable in any way with allowing that level of violence to determine the social relations in the post-war South, especially when he had an entire party at his heels ready to ready and willing to affirm a putative approach to the former slave owners. Uh, and that is why I really want to, you know, do something with that idea, because uh, it is one of those places where, like, the shadow of history sort of casts its pall and, and you get you just shiver and you think what could have been. But, uh, but yeah, it, everybody but Andrew Johnson by the end of the war knew that there was no way that you could just wish away social conflict. In fact, uh, a white former governor of North Carolina, and I'll end with this quote, uh, said in 1865, with reference to emancipation, we are at the beginning of the war. And that is the reality of it. And some people were aware of that and accepting of it. Others weren't. And the real tragedy of American history, one of them, is that one of the people who wasn't, or if he was, he didn't care, was the fucking president of the United States. Okay, so that's the overview. So we're going to do chapters... Four and five for next Wednesday. If anybody has wants to talk about it a little bit here, uh, I'd be happy to. Someone asked, would Lincoln have abolished the Constitution? Lincoln loved the Constitution. And the problem is everybody loved the Constitution. I don't think that the Constitution would have been abolished, you know, like that. I do um, I do see a, a possibility after a protracted conflict, after a protracted, like essentially a second civil war, which would have happened. Planters and their allies would have resisted. That the exigencies, the realities of administering this, like I've said, uh... The, the Republicans were pushed way beyond their comfort zone in terms of uh, uh, abrogating authority from the Constitution by the exigencies of prosecuting the war. If that war had continued to be prosecuted, not as a ground campaign with armies, but as the suppression of a guerrilla movement and the standing up of a new like multiracial uh, order in the South, that that process that dynamic of the constitution sort of being pressed and uh, and the verities that underlied it being challenged and undermined i think that would have continued too and then maybe even not lincoln but maybe you know maybe a sumner administration or something says all right let's fucking rip this fucking thing up and really that was that would have been a necessity to affirm a A political structure for this country that would have been flexible and um, flexible enough to a a accommodate uh, subaltern demands, and it would not obviously have led to some sort of peaceful uh, um, socialism. You know, I think that the the German example pretty clearly shows that that's not in the cards. 
that capitalism knows where the line is and will fight for it. But every move towards the creation of a of a genuinely multi uh, racial and multi ethnic working class means that those points of conflict become more and more uh, contestable by the working class, which is the opposite of what we had in this country, where at every step, every working class uh, explosion has been contained and nullified over time. The most sustained one, of course, being in the early 30s, being contained into the, the structure of the New Deal, and then over the course of the next 30 years, uh, sort of dissipated and, and co-opted and neutralized. And now we are in the situation where class as a felt social ex uh, experience no longer exists and has to be rebuilt. And any way you slice it, the institutions that the Constitution has left us with are huge hindrances to that and are eventually going to have to be directly conflicted with. To the, uh, episode 500 will not be a clip show. There's going to be plenty of new stuff. I've not seen the new Curtis doc yet. I will, though. i got to watch it soon. How long is that fucking thing? Oh, man. Six hours. Jeepers. Christmas. Okay, I better get, I better get cracking then. Eight, wow, ten, holy mackerel! It's it's in a, it actually never ends. You start watching it and you watch it forever. It's like the entertainment in Infinite Chess. I did watch Community to the end, and I did like the Yahoo season. I think the Yahoo season gets underrated. Keith David is great in it. Have I read The Killer Angels? Who do you think you're talking to? Of course I read The Killer Angels. I read The Killer Angels when I was like 12. And I even went to, uh, I saw Gettysburg in the theater as a little kid. And most brutally, I saw Gods and Generals in theater, which is genuinely the worst movie I've ever paid to see. And I watched the whole fucking three hours. Ooh, that movie is dog shit. And what's beautiful about it is, yes, it is noxious Confederate apologia, but it is also a terrible movie, just from the point of view of, of filmmaking. It sucks. And the funniest thing about it is, is that, like with most Civil War movies, it saves money with its battle scenes by just having reenactors do it. They just say, hey, you freaks who already own your own uh, period, detail, accurate guns and uniforms, you guys come and do a battle and we'll film it. Well, the thing is, the, the problem is the average Confederate American uh, war, Civil War reenactor is like a 45-year-old like carpet salesman who's got like a gut like a fucking Michelin tire around his neck, around his stomach. And then you watch these shows and you watch these battle scenes and you just see these round-ass guys like eating minnow balls. In, and it's, that's not the Civil War. The Civil War was like 90-pound 18-year-olds shooting each other. But there is a scene where, uh, where former Senator George Allen from Virginia and a bunch of other guys play dress up as Confederate generals, 
and sing along to uh, the Bonnie Blue Flag that is a genuinely surreal and hilarious moment. Uh, very just classic kitsch. I was in Vegas this time last year. Time certainly flies, or does it? I don't know. It's been like one long day, but also 500 years. Oh, somebody else asked me a uh, question on Twitter that I thought would be a good uh, thing to, uh, to answer here because it is an interesting question. Somebody said they want to know what is what would be, was there a European uh, equivalent of the 1905 revolution? And yeah, it's uh, the 1848 revolutions. And the fact that they happened in 1848 and the, it happened in 1905 in Russia tells you really all you need to know, which is Russia was... <laughs> way 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 behind europe and and by the time it had its uh its first stirrings of, of like a social ferment away from uh, uh it's so it, the, the the social ferment that comes from the impose imposition of capitalism into a, a feudal system that's what the uh 1848 revolution was and by that point in russia you literally still had enslaved uh, uh land land held like baron held serfs in russia you did you, they had they had a serfdom that was uh more uh like in more embedded and 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 uh and immovable than serfdom had been in continental europe for in some cases hundreds of years And so they didn't get their uh, they didn't get their first like explosion of that until 8, 1905. I have read Late Victorian Holocaust by Mike Davis. Great book. Why does everyone think Carter was so great? If anybody thinks Carter is great, it's got to be. There's the only people I can think of who think Carter is great are people who like that he his post presidential career, which I think is largely commendable. People who like the fact that some American president has called Israeli uh, occupation apartheid, which also commendable. If you liked his presidency, though, it's either because you are just a contrarian who who wants to stand up for somebody who was uh, sort of unfairly maligned. Uh, and honestly, he was unfairly maligned for a lot of the stuff that people blamed him for publicly, like the hostage crisis. Although, you know, they didn't have to fucking give the Shah uh, sanctuary and let him go and do can get his cancer treatment. Let, uh... But I think a lot of the people like it, like it because like him because they feel like he was honest with the American people in a way that like Reagan wasn't and that he was punished for being honest. And 
that is just that's perfect liberalism. It's, it is it is the most perfect. It is the ideology at its most fine. Because of course, Carter was telling the American people stop being materialistic, stop stop measuring freedom by what you can buy and what you can spend, without giving any indication that he was going to change the underlying economic engine of this country, which depended on that. He just wanted you to feel bad. He wanted you to 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 have a little uh, hall monitor in your head to to judge you for your uh, for your desires while still living in a society completely dominated by consumerism. And more than anything, that's just bad politics. And of course, it got completely rinsed by Reagan saying, no, we'll cut taxes and everybody could keep partying. I mean, that's the thing. It's like Carter was partly human. Car par Carter, I don't think, is a real reptile. But he was a real liberal. He was a real ideologically committed liberal. And that is, that makes you an enemy to, to the human race. <laughs> even if you don't know that you are. Even if you think you are. That's one of the beauties of liberalism. Is it can convince anybody that they are doing things for everyone's good. When in fact they're just reinforcing and protecting the system from uh, f from uh, it's from the downward pressures from pressures from below. And of course, he had a very bad foreign policy. I mean, he fucking sent uh, money to the Mujahideen before the Soviets even invaded, in order, in part, to trigger an invasion. What was the de this is interesting. Somebody says, "What was the deal? Classical? When was the decade classical liberalism stopped being progressive?" Uh, it was about the time that the term progressive was discovered was uh, coined the eight the late eighteen hundreds. Uh, it's important to note that this it's the the people who have been progressives since the turn of the century, the 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 tier of people who are in in uh that middle tier of academics politicians managers, lawyers, professional managerial types, uh, they were, in the 19th century, uh, they had a strict adherence to uh, small government orthodoxy, hard money, uh, and uh, survival of the fittest social doctrines. And what happened over time is that that went from being a uh, the most humane way to organize a government because it opposed monarchy, concentrated power, and slavery because the, the, the anti-slavery forces in the North, the, the, the Northern Whigs who were opposed to slavery, did so through because they believed it was morally wrong to, for anyone to be compelled to labor by anything other than the market. The market should be what compels you to labor, not everybody. Of course, that doesn't stand for every abolitionist. Wendell Phillips, for example, and John Brown, for that matter, didn't think that. But that was the pervading orthodoxy. It was the most humane way to organize capitalism. But by the end of the Gilded Age, that system had broken down. And the new people who came to that social or uh, to, came to those social positions, it's not the same people, remember. They're dying out, and they're being replaced by new people. And the new ones they're replaced by, have, they find that that orthodoxy doesn't work anymore. And their new understanding of the most humane way to organize capitalism is through uh, uh, mixed economy, uh, uh, social safety net, welfare, the, the things that become the progressive model that has dominated ever since. But it's the same social strata all along. All right, and this is a couple more. I'm going to go. <laughs> I 
Thoughts on St. Louis. I don't really have thought any thoughts about the city. I do have some thoughts about the saint. Uh, I don't know if you guys know this, but he was actually he's a king of he was king of France. I believe the only king of France to have been sanctified or beatified. Uh, and he uh, was a very, very uh, earnest and and passionate crusader, but also a very bad one. Uh, he did a couple of crusades that were uh, complete botches, and he actually died on campaign in Africa uh, of dysentery, shitting his doo-doo house out in a camp. And then they made him a saint for that. Why do I hate the English? They're the one. I mean, I don't hate the English like as people, but like English civilization, those are the guys. Their combination of uh, technology and bureaucracy, and when I say technology, I mean things like Protestantism and uh, and uh, you know uh, their naval naval stores and shit like that, du uh, double entry bookkeeping, whatever that they, bu whatever bundle of things they came together, not only gave them a technological spear sort of to to use in the in the battle for world resources but it also generated a culture of bureaucracy that allowed them to carry out monstrous acts of colonial domination while maintaining a civil veneer and a uh functioning um political culture in the metropole and that model is the model that all capitalism has followed ever since. We were just took the baton from them. Now that's why you could just give me give me a time machine and let me just honestly, I don't even have to give Napoleon like a modern navy because what would they know? They wouldn't know how to do with it. Just give them some fucking ketchup packets. Give the French some fucking ketchup packets so that they can go out and out on the sea and not have to worry about getting scurvy. Just give them some fucking barrels of ketchup packets to just go out and then they put the ketchup on their food and then they don't have to worry about their teeth falling out and the dumb limeys have to fucking, you know, they have to turn back because they ran out of produce and they're all, they got all got giant uh, bruises from their frickin' scurvy. Because that the bureaucratic culture, the, the, that that alienation that is central to English social order, and that we then transmogrified into like a mo mad dog settler colonial version of it, has has rendered meaning, has destroyed any meaning beyond that which can be quantified, has destroyed social meaning, has destroyed the soul, and we are all now living in this desanctified soulless universe that these fucking limeys created. But again, that's not the fault of English people now. Although a lot of them do seem to be very genuinely miserable and more than anything sad that they are fucking empires and still around, which is how is that like people like people are often horrified by the Turks for not recognizing the Armenian genocide, which they should be, or for the Japanese for acting like they didn't do anything wrong in Manchuria. But look at the English whining, crying that their empire is gone. When the fact is, is that for the crimes their empire committed, they should have just had the entire island detonated and sunk into the North Sea. They got to keep their shit. They got to keep the Elgin marbles. And they're going to whine and complain that they don't have their empire anymore? The fucking gall. All right, I think that uh, I think Bertovo is going to be streaming uh, Fortnite pretty soon, so I'm going to log off. Uh, hopefully, God willing, and the creek don't rise. Wednesday, we will be talking about chapters four and five, four five of Reconstruction. Bye bye.